Ambassador Wood sat tapping his fingers against his leg in annoyed anticipation. He had been waiting for over an hour, and he didn't like to be kept waiting. The Fremorian Empire was really trying his patience. Sunny Wood walked over to him and signalled that the Council would see him now. He thanked her and walked quickly to where he was expected. The Council chambers were rather smaller than he thought. He'd been expecting a large room designed to intimidate and inspire fear, but as far as he could tell, it was really just a big boardroom, not all that far off the ones back home. One of the speakers seemed to realise he was there and welcomed him. Ambassador Woods of Sol, it is an honour to meet you. We have never before seen a race come from so close, and yet seem like they come from a place so far. Council member Muluksha was the only herbivore on the council. Her race was known as the Volites, a massive nine-foot-tall race of what is basically a bipedal moose people. A proud and old race, but still the only herbivores left on the council. Ambassador Woods bowed to show his respect, and then addressed the five council members in front of him. It is an honour and a privilege to be here. I thank you for inviting my humble race to these proceedings. The ambassador had been trying to make a good first impression, but it seemed that at least two of the three council members were agitated. Maybe his opening was too much. Yes, yes, let us press on to the matter at hand, shall we? One of the other races, was thought he was an Enrique, responded in a no-nonsense tone. He couldn't see much of the man due to his ceremonial robe, but the general size and rudeness seemed to fit. Enreki are one of the smaller races, but what they lack in size, they more than make up for in sheer viciousness, with razor-sharp claws that can cut through almost anything just shy of reinforced steel. Looking very similar to a small bear, they'd almost been considered cute back on Earth. Yes, let's. The woman next to him looked like a cross between a wolf and a dog, with thick black fur and a fair share of scars across her face and neck. She looked like she'd seen a hundred battles and survived them all. He knew her immediately as a wicketer. The other two didn't say anything, but Woods recognised them from his many years of military intelligence. Rather hard to forget the not-so-pretty faces of the Galagians and the Morians, genetic cousins. But aside from that, they looked nothing alike, one looking like a boar with very sharp teeth, the other looking more like an eagle with four arms and no wings. You are here before us today to represent your peoples, but as far as this castle is concerned, you are just another small species to dread in our shadow. The short and Reki said with next to no hesitation, and a sense of smile passed on his. So if you want to join this council or become a species under its protection, then you either have to pay with resources or blood. Now the only ones without a smile were Woods, with an expression of cold determination, a Luxia, who didn't like to see the carnivals bully the new races, but she couldn't do much to resist them herself. Her race had been on the council since the start, but shortly after they met the Wicketer and the Enreki, the council had started to become more carnivore than herbivore, and they certainly meant to keep it that way. Woods had hoped that the council would be better than previously observed, but alas, his hopes were crushed, although not entirely. If I may, council members, I have an alternative offer, Woods said with a straight face, and a commanding tone that quieted the room a bit. Ah, and what might that be, little one? This time it was the Galagian that spoke up. I offer you a chance for us to get to know one another better, before you make us choose between those two ridiculous choices. I am extending a personal invitation to each one of you to come and visit Sol. We are just finishing production of our first Titan-class ship, and it would be an honour if you were all in attendance. Woods knew that none of the races before him knew what a Titan was, so by all accounts they were in for a shock. The carnivores on the council talked amongst each other, and after a few moments they came to a decision. We accept this proposal, but we do not see how a race as new to the stars as yours with anything of interest to us other than the materials of your ships themselves. The Wicketer looked almost confused by the counteroffer, just as the other members, even Bluxia, but couldn't see any reason why not to indulge the little primate. For the first time since the meeting had started, it was now Ambassador Woods who had a sinister-looking smile on his face. I am sure you will all find the trip to be very much worth your while, Councilmember Chasuk. And certainly at the very least, one to remember. Fine. We will make the proper preparations and we will meet at the coordinates of your homeworld. These meetings are adjourned. The council slowly stood up and walked out to their representative quarters to begin preparations, although not the same ones the old ambassador had been looking for. About a month later, the ships started to arrive, each council member opting to bring their own ship instead of sharing one together. The Enreki and the Wicketer had both brought their biggest warships to be intimidating, while the Gilgians and the Morians had opted instead for smaller but significantly faster and more manoeuvrable ships, 
each capable of delivering quite the nasty little punch with enough high-powered lasers to melt the Eiffel Tower in an instant five times over. By comparison, the Volatus ship was a toy, it had next to no visible weapons, was half the size of even the smaller ships brought, but looked like it was more designed to take a hit and still make a speedy escape than it was for dealing damage. Admiral Woods sat aboard the space station Hadfield, looking at his command console in eager anticipation. It had taken almost a full month, but finally they were all here and ready for the show. He tapped a few buttons, and every council member popped on his screen at roughly the same time. Hello, and welcome to Sol, also known as Earth. It's good to see you all again. I hope your time travelling here wasn't too uncomfortable. Yes, yes. Let us not waste any more time, Ambassador. Where is this so-called ship you wish us to see? As far as our sensors can tell, your station is the only one orbiting your world. And what few ships there are couldn't impress a child, let alone this council. The Enreki was as always impatient as ever, probably edgy to start their own malicious plans. Apologies, Councilmember Verum. We are expecting the Tom Kenny shortly. It is just taking longer than we thought for it to arrive. Woods had a hard time holding back his grin, as he got great joy from making the council members wait, even if he knew they were up to something he wasn't worried. Fine, but be warned we do not like to be kept waiting. And with that, all but one of the members signed off, leaving Woods looking at Councilmember Mluksha, with only the slightest of confused looks on his face. She looked like she wanted to tell him something, but refrained. I look forward to seeing your ship, Ambassador. And she was gone. She really wants to warn us? We'll have to take that into consideration? He thought to himself, while inputting a new message into his console. Command's going to want to know about this. Another hour later, and the Enreki had lost all patience. He'd ordered his ship move closer to Earth, and the others followed suit. Council members, I see you are closing the gap between yourselves and Sol. May I ask why? Woods knew damn well why, but he just wanted an excuse to annoy them a little more. Without even responding once, the Enreki ship had closed enough of the gap. Two more ships dropped out of FTL, right behind the rest, and then another and another, until there was a small war fleet heading for Earth, consisting of the original five plus eight more. Woods held the Wicketer this time, asking the same question again. May I ask what the meaning of this is? It appears you have a small invasion fleet heading towards Earth. It's kind of should have been a dead giveaway. They'd done similar attacks in other worlds and races, but none have been so calm during it. It's simple. You are weak. We are strong. We will take your race to use as slaves, and your resources to enrich our own. And there's nothing your pathetic species can do to stop us. With that said, she ordered her crew to fire at the space station Hadfield. But just before the charged laser shots hit the station, they hit something else instead. Admiral Rimmer had been waiting for Tom Kenny for exactly the right moment to make his presence known, and hostile forces attacking Earth seemed like the perfect time. He ordered his Titan-class warship between Hadfield and the alien forces, and when their lasers hit him, instead of the Hadfield, he'd ordered the cloak dropped, and all weapon batteries to begin firing on the lead ship first. The Enreki never stood a chance as four railgun shots landed dead centre, cutting through the shields and hull like a hot knife through butter. It was quite the spectacle. Titan-class ships are big, Roughly three miles long, with enough firepower on board to destroy a planet five times over, and enough armor and advanced shields to take just about the same damage as well. It was an absolute beast, with four hull mounted railguns, but unbeknownst to the Council races, it wasn't new, and it wasn't the only one humanity had at its disposal. After losing the Enreki Council member to the vacuum of space, the Enreki forces seemed to slow down by a considerable amount. Hmm, they don't seem to be good at losing leadership, something to keep in mind for the future. The Admiral had been taking personal notes on the enemy forces since before the battle even started, and he thought at least for the moment he'd figure them out. They focused on strength. The stronger you were, the more they feared or respected you. He intended to make them do both. He punched in orders into his console and watched as three other Titan-class ships appeared out of nowhere, circling the enemy fleet like sharks smelling blood in the water. The remaining ships started to fire on the Titans, but it proved a pointless effort, as each of the four Titans' railguns picked a target and simply watched them vanish. The only ships that seemed to be able to do anything against the Titans were the Gulligans and the Morians. Although anything simply consisted of dodging and firing pointless laser barrages at the massive ships, whose shields were barely even flickering. All it took was one hit each, and the ships cracked like an egg on concrete. Once the third council ship had fallen silent, and the only ships remaining were the Voltros and the Wichita, the Admiral sent out a message. This is Fleet Admiral Abel Rimmer of the United Earth ship Tom Kenny. If you surrender, you will be treated with respect and given the opportunity to return home, so long as this sticky little situation doesn't lead into a greater war. While I have no doubt you will all badly lose. So what's it going to be? 
The Vorotos were the first to respond by powering down what few weapons they had on board. Not that they'd even fired them, as the Admiral had noted. Suddenly, instead of the Tom Kenny making demands, it was the Wicketer Council member, Jasuk, screaming in anger. We will never surrender to your trickery! You may have fooled us this time, but you will all pay! She almost sounded defeated for yelling. Almost as if deep down she knew she was wrong, and that it was her race that would pay, along with the others, for trying to bully every new race they came across. So be it. Fire! The Admiral watched as all four ships fired a single shot from one of their four hull-mounted railguns, and the Wicketer ship simply ceased to be, the only evidence being bits of space debris and the bodies of the crew floating in space. Attention, Vorotos ship. You're about to be boarded. The men who are on their way to take you and your ship prisoner are incredibly well trained and use kinetic weaponry, so please, for your own sake, please don't resist. My men are under orders to be gentle and take both your crew and ship in one piece. Without even being asked, Maluksha sent a message back. Admiral, you and your men are most welcome. Any race who demonstrates the honour you have shown us today is a friend to the Vorotis. Maluksha couldn't believe her own eyes when she first realised her ship was the only one left, even more so when her tactical officer told her that none of the human ships had even come close to firing on hers. True honour, as her people put it, is to know when to kill and when not to kill, and the humans seemed to demonstrate their quality with near pinpoint precision, having eliminated any ship that fired upon them. She thanked the stars that she had ordered her ship to hold fire. A few days later, Ambassador Woods was sitting in the large room with two different chairs, one for him and one for his honoured guest. The boarding party had been met with cheers of praise more than anything, and Aurora Tos on board weren't afraid to show their disgust for the other council races, and their happiness at humanity's ability to combat them so efficiently. Maluksha had been taken on board a shuttle, and been directly transported to the Hatfield, where Ambassador Woods was waiting patiently. Shortly after arriving, Maluksha had been escorted to the interrogation room where Woods sat. He was looking forward to this next part. 